back, back again. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. And I say again, rejoice and be glad in this day. I hope you've had a wonderful week. May have had some obstacles in the way. But God is able and will, and I know he has, helped you to overcome them. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day, our lives, health, and strength. And Lord, we ask that you teach your Bible study. Help us to rightly divide your word, Lord, and grow in your word and mature in your word so that we can reach out to someone else. Forgive us of anything we said, thought, or done that was not pleasing in your sight. And help us, Lord, to be more of you and less of ourselves. We pray for all the sick, the shut-in, the bereaved, those who may be having mental problems, Lord, those who are incarcerated, just to all your people as a whole, Lord. There's no problem that you can't handle. There's no situation that you can't work out. We just thank you, Lord, for our life, health, and strength. But most of all, we thank you, Lord, for saving our souls and make an eternal home for us when we leave this earth. We pray and ask all these things and give you thanks, give you honor, give you praise. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Like I said, I hope you've had a good week. I've had a busy one as always, but I thank God. You know, I thank God each and every day because sometimes life can be challenging, but I thank Him. At the end of the day, when I close my eyes and I'm reclining in the bed, I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for helping me to go to the bank. Thank you for helping me to go to the grocery store. I thank you for all those things, because you know, sometimes you can't do those things. And God give us the ability of our mind, our eyes, our smell, our mouth, our limbs, so that we can do those things. And I just thank him for all that he has done for me. Saying all that, we have a beautiful lesson today. And it's dealing with the word as always, like we've been talking about for these last few weeks. But today we're gonna to be dealing with the word heals. The word heals. And I just thank God because you know, a lot of times we go to the doctor, I'm not saying don't go, if you need to go, go. But we rely on everything except God. He's most of the time our last result. And I was telling with my husband a couple of weeks ago, and you know, we have a tendency of saying, well, all we can do is pray. And you say this, that that's the last result. But it should be the beginning. All we have to do is pray. And God, those of us who are in the household of faith, who's in the body of Christ, He said, I will answer you. Call on me. Jeremiah 33, 3. I will answer you. So I thank God that we serve a God who we call on Him. He will come to our rescue. It's not all we can do is pray. All we have to do is pray. Okay? Our background, we're going to go into a little background so we'll know what we're dealing with. I like to kind of get a little appetizer before we go into the main course here. And we're dealing with a place called Capricanium. Capricanium is located on the northwestern side shore of the Sea of Galilee. Capricanium, a city in the Galilean province, was a central location for Jesus' early earthly ministry. Jesus lived in Nazareth until he came to Galilee and was baptized by John the Baptist. Mark 1 9. After John the Baptist was in prison, Jesus returned to Galilee and resided in Capernaum. Matthew 4, 12 through 16. Here on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the Lord called his first disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, 
and John. And this is taken from Matthew, the 14th chapter, 18 to 22 verses. Peter's home in Capricaeum became the residence, listen this, the residence for Jesus and the apostles when, when they were not traveling. So Jesus lived with Peter and his disciples. So Peter opened up his house to Jesus and the disciples. And that's taken in Mark, the first chapter, 29th, and then again in Luke, the fourth chapter, 38th verse. The Lord often preached in the synagogue in Capricaeum, Mark 1, 21, and John 6, 52 to 59 and perform many miracles in the city. These miracles included the healing of the centurion's servant, Matthew 8, 5 through 13, the healing of a man with the palsy, Mark 2, 1 through 12, and the casting out of demon of a demon in a man in the synagogue, Luke 4, 31-36. Even though Jesus performed so many miracles in Capricaeum, the people still had not repented. Matthew 11, 23-24 And I just want to pose this to you. The question was, why do people who have so much evidence of God's work refuse to see it? And you know what I think? That they are looking for a quick fix rather than the, the, situ the, the, the solver of the situation. A lot of people, Lord, if you would just get me out of this, I'll serve you. I'll come to church. I'll do this and I'll do that and the other. But as soon as things get back to normal, they forget about God. They're looking for a quick fix instead of the permanent transformation in Christ. Cana of Galilee is the birthplace of miracles in Jesus' ministry. The healing of this nobleman's son is notable as Capricaeum is approximately 16 miles away from Cana. This miracle is not only notable because of the geographic distance, but because it makes Jesus return to Galilee. March Jesus return to Galilee. Prior to Jesus' arrival in Cana, Jesus had taken a journey through Judea and Galilee. Jesus was compelled to go to Samaria. Historically, the Samaritans were condemned by the Jewish people. Yet Jesus needed to go to Samaria. You know why? He had another mission there. Yes, where he met the woman at the well. Who Jesus told about the healing water instead of the physical water. And she was so amazed about what he told her about her life and that water. And she said, I want this water while I'll never thirst again. And she left and she became the first woman evangelist. Yet Jesus needed to go to Samaria. Samaria. Jesus encountered the Samaritan woman at Jacob's web. John 4, 1 through 6. Jesus' natural thirst was used to fulfill the spiritual thirst of the Samaritan woman. Leading Jesus and the Samaritan woman to have a life-altering life-changing exchange. Jesus received his identity, Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus revealed his identity to the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman found saving, believing faith in Jesus. Her encounter with Jesus caused a revival in Samaria. The Samaritan woman was the first, as I said, recorded female evangelist in the Bible. John, the fourth chapter, 39 to 42 verses. Jesus was recognized as the Messiah 
and was honored accordingly. So Jesus had a purpose. Now he has gone and encountered this. But this is as the day or as the days go by, he's getting ready to make another encounter. And we're going to begin the meat of the, of the lesson. Flawed believing faith. Flawed believing faith. And it's taken from John, the fourth chapter, verses 46 through 47. And it reads like this. So Jesus came again into Canaan of Galilee. Jesus did a lot of traveling. When he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. This is saying as he had traveled, and as I said, Jesus traveled through Galilee, he came again into Canaan where he had turned the water into wine at the request of his mother at a wedding. There was a governmental official, a nobleman, in nearby Capernaum who had a sick little boy and he was very sick, sick to the point of death. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son who was about to die. So he had heard of Jesus, heard about him. Now he's a big official, as you would say today, big government official. But we know that there are sometimes desperate needs in our lives that you don't care what title, how much money, where you live, or what you have to go through so that you can get a solution to your problem. And this nobleman was at that point. His little boy was sick. His child was sick. And he had heard of Jesus and his healing power. How he did these miracles. So he wanted Jesus to come with him so that he could revive his son. The second segment of the lesson, the challenge of faith. And it's taken from verse 48. And it says, Then said Jesus unto him, said unto the noble one, that's what Jesus is speaking to him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Will you never believe in me unless you see miracles, signs, and wonders. Jesus is asking him that. Are you, will you believe in me just because you will see a sign and wonder that I go with you? It is evident that the nobleman had believing faith. Yet his faith was hindered by his thinking and experience. The nobleman believed the sickness of his son is what brought him to Jesus. Yes. But Jesus knew that the nobleman needed to be challenged in his faith to accept the reality of him being the Messiah. And to demonstrate that his word mm, is as powerful as his presence when believed. The nobleman's faith in Jesus was sparked by what he heard. He had heard, he had heard all the news of how this man was healing. This man making and working miracles that no man could do on this earth. But his faith needed to be mature so that it could be strengthened by his own experience with Jesus. The challenge of his son's illness brought him to Jesus so that his reality 
of Jesus could be challenged. God, Jesus, ask them, do you just want me to do signs and wonders? Is that why you believe in me? Do I have to be there? Is that why you believe in me? But Jesus is getting ready to give him an experience that will be everlasting. The third statement. Dismantling earthly expectations. And we too, we too often put expectations and think that okay, I know God can help me, but I know God will help me if Trust in Him. And I know it's more than just mouth service. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to trust Him more. I love this song. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word. We have to take the Lord at His word. When we pray, we're asking God, what's your will? What's the best thing for you to do? Because I know one thing. God knows the whole situation. Even before we're encountered with it. He knows the beginning. He knows the middle. He knows the outcome. Because He is in control. He's a sovereign God. So we need to exercise our faith just like this nobleman. It's going to have to do. Okay. Again, dismantling earthly expectations. And it's taken from verses 49 to 51. And this is the way it reads The nobleman, <coughs> excuse me, said unto him, Jesus, Sir, come down. Ere my child die. Come on with me, or my child will die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy son liveth. <laughs> and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Now, we know that Jesus has been to places and he's touched. But Jesus, this is, when I was reading this, I just said, wow. Jesus, he, the man is begging, Lord, come with me. My son is at the point of death. I need you to come. Show your presence. Pray over him and heal him. And Jesus just told him, go your way. Your son, baby, go on. Your son is living. And the man got up and he went this way. And he went because he said, Jesus said, my son liveth. But you can imagine that he had thoughts in his mind. Why didn't he come with me? We're going to find out that there's power in the word of God. Power. In the word of God. Dismantling. Take it off. Earthly expectations. Often crises reveal our expectation of God. Jesus' encounter on earth were designed to shift our perspective from the earth to heaven. The nobleman had an earthly expectation of what Jesus could do. Heal. It could only happen if Jesus came in person. So he thought. Jesus needed the nobleman to understand that the power of God is unhindered by time or space. Jesus gave a direct order that dismantled the nobleman's expectation and increase his faith. 
He said, go that way. Thy son liveth. The nobleman believed what Jesus said and obediently followed his directive. John 4, 50. The obedient response indicate that his faith increased. Jesus said it. I believe it. So I'm like, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know he's going to do it. I'm going to get the victory. And that's that faith that that no one had. The obedient response indicate that his faith increased. The nobleman journeyed to Capernaum and was met by his servant to conform, confirm the words of Jesus. His son is living. We must. What can we do to dismantle our earthly expectation and exchange? For my situations. First of all, we must trust God. We must trust God. And then we have to remember that God keeps His word, He keeps His promise. He's a God that cannot lie. And again, remember how He has always been there for you and for me. And you know, a lot of times we get a little weary and we, oh, I hope the Lord will work this out. Talk to him. Give it to him. And trust him. And before you know it, it has come to pass. We serve a God that's not limited to space and time. He's eternal. He created, he made everything and everything acknowledge the sovereign power of God except man we have to be molded again and again and again but once we've had the transformation in our lives the change from the things of the world to Christ we need to have a steadfast, unmovable faith that our God will deliver. Think about it. How God, even in Bible stories, delivered. Put in a lion's den, Daniel, the three Hebrew boys, put in the fiery furnace, and so many more. And what about your situation? God has delivered you out of things when some people said, oh, they'll never amount to anything. But look at God. Oh, you're not approved for this long. But you got things anyway. Look at God. Oh, you're just not doing good. You won't be able to walk, talk, speak, touch. But look at God. And sometimes those same people that said you wouldn't, you have to minister to them. Because of your faith. In God. So let us not forget where He has brought us from. And let us not forget where He's going to carry us. Because God will never forsake us nor leave us. I thank God for His word. The fourth segment of this. It's called the healing word of Jesus. The healing word of Jesus. And I just thank God because he is so good to all of us. And when I read this last little segment here, beginning at 52 through 54, I just got blessed. And I'll tell you about that. 52 says, Then inquired he, who, the nobleman, of them, the hour, them who, 
the servants that met him when he began to amend. And they said unto him, When did he begin to amend? And they said, Yesterday at the seventh hour, which was one o'clock, the fever left him. Mm. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And himself believed, and his whole household believed. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. When did he get better? And they said, the seventh hour, which is one o'clock. And he remembered that that was the time that I was talking to Jesus. And when Jesus told me that my son liveth, the word <laughs> went further than Jesus, if Jesus would have walked there or rode there. God's word would not go out and return void. I got so happy. Now this nobleman, he said, come on home with me. I want you to heal my son. But there was another situation of a satyrian soldier who had a servant that was sick. And he said, Jesus, you don't even have to come to my house. Because the Satyrian soldier didn't think he was worthy, really. He was a big uh, man over 100, 100 people, 100 soldiers. But he said, just speak the word. And his faith of not just having Jesus' presence, but he knew that the word could go faster and more powerful. We are very 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 blessed to know that we have a savior who just speaks the word and as I said maybe on last week I can't remember sometime but that word is powerful God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit when they was created in the earth the world the whole world, the universe, and all those things. Jesus, another name for him, is the word. He spoke it. Jesus could have destroyed those men when they came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. When they asked we see Jesus of Nazareth. And the word of God tells you that Jesus said, I am he. And they asked him, where's Jesus of Nazareth? And he said, I am he. You know, they, they fell back, was filled out. He could have destroyed them, but that was not time yet. I think about when he comes back with us, those of who are believers have accepted him as their Lord and Savior. He's not going to be doing this. He's going to speak the word. And it will destroy him. Because he said his mouth is sharper than any two-edged sword. His word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word. So if God says it, you better and best believe that it's the truth. Because his word is what created. His word is what make. And that centurion, he said, just speak the word. You just speak it. And I know that my servant would be healed. 
and his whole household was saved. This nobleman, this father who was pleading for his child life, he said, come. And Jesus did not come because Jesus wanted him to know that it wasn't so much his presence, it was his word. What he said out of his mouth, it preceded him. It, the child was healed before he got home. And he said, when did this happen? When did he when, when, when did he get better? And they said, the fever broke. <laughs> the seventh hour, one o'clock. Mm. That was the time that Jesus told me to go away, that my son liveth. Who wouldn't serve a God? To say, let it be done, and it's done. I thank God. Because I've had situations where I wanted to fret. And wanted to sometimes throw my hands up. But he said, why are you throwing your hands up? <laughs> Praise me. And at first, I did it reluctantly. But then, the more I praised him, the more the joy, I could feel the all of joy coming back inside of me. And I want to say, we're living in a time now. This, these past two and a half years of this pandemic, people, we have experienced stuff that we've never really experienced before. And I hate to say that it, I don't believe it's gonna get any better and things will never be like they were. People don't come to the assemblies to worship anymore, to praise God. They're comfortable in their own. But let me tell you something, times are gonna get even worse. And unless you have an anchor, really, so really depending on Christ, you'll be ready to give up. You hear more people now, more advertisement on TV and radio talking about people committing suicide because they don't have the hope. We have to. Stay in the Word. Stay in Christ. Because He is our peace. I believe that, and I know for sure, that sometimes when I may be having a long, a long day, because the joy of the Lord is my strength, but when I need a little bit more, I go to the Word of God again. And I say, Lord, I need a word. And I thank God because he has given me the desire to, to want more and more of him. But I had a day just this week, I had some people that had been sick who had gone, gone home. And I was just thinking, Lord, and I had had my devotional, I had my time with the Lord. And I was just sitting there and said, but Lord, I'm not filled. I'm not full. I need a. I need some more of you. So I did. I got into uh, put on some of my uh, the tapes of uh, some of my uh, ministers and stuff, and began to listen. And I could feel that I was getting full. Please stay in the word. Music, I love. I love music. I do. But it's nothing like the Word. Because it helps you to grow. And when you can read it, and sometimes my eyes are a little different too now because I have cataracts and that's why you see me changing glasses. 
because some I have to see and some I need a little bit more extra to, to read some of this fine print. But even if you have to listen to it on the tape or whatever, have your time with God so that he can minister to you. Because if you don't, you will become depressed. You will feel like giving up. But when you hear the word, speak the word, that rejuvenates you. That brings a revival on the inside of you. And you can feel him coming up in you so that you can go on. So that you can grow. And so that you can encourage someone else. God is good. And he is faithful. And I thank him. And I love him more and more each day. God keeps his promises. And a lot of times, when we want to give up, don't do that. Go to God in prayer. Why did Jesus challenge the nobleman regarding signs and wonders? And that's taken from John 4.48. He challenged him so that he would believe in the word in him. And like I said, between the, the uh, uh, centurion soldier and this nobleman, the centurion soldier knew the power of the word and he told Jesus, just speak the word. But that nobleman had not come to that point yet. So Jesus had to show him that I didn't need to be there. Only thing you needed to do will speak the word and believe. I'm not coming with you, but I'm going to speak the word. And before you get home, your little boy will be healed. We have to have that steadfast faith. The Lord, I'm asking, and I believe that you're going to work this situation out. Compare and contrast as we did. And think about it. Speak the word, Lord, and I know that my servant would be healed. And after Jesus had done that, his whole household was saved. The same it was even with the nobleman, although he thought that Jesus had to be right there. But Jesus let him know, my word supersedes my presence. Because you see today, Jesus doesn't come down and sit with us and say it's going to be all right. But the Holy Spirit talks to us. Jesus speaks to us too through his word. And he's telling us, speak the word. I'm there. You can't see me, but I'm there. I'm right there with you. But you must have faith and you must believe and you must stand on the promises that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I'm a God that cannot and will not lie. And I will help you in your situation. It is important to examine our expectations of, of healing. We must remember and trust God completely. Leave that but out of your conversation and that if when it comes to Christ, especially if you are a part of him, God is not going to let himself suffer. He's already done that for us. But he wants us to have life and to have it more abundantly in him. We must believe and that impact 
when we believe it and receive it from God, we must have faith to know that God will deliver and he knows what's best for us. And I thank him. God said, I'm not going. I'm going to stay here. I'm not going down that 15 mile uh, journey. I'm going to stay right here. But you go home and things will be in order when you get there. Trust God. Trust Him to know that He knows what's best for all of us. And He would never, never leave us nor forsake us. I hope you've gotten some out of this list and I have. And I thank God. And we all have to be reminded. That's why we have to read the Word every day. We have to be reminded that God is a God that will deliver. And that we serve a God who can do things that no man can do. His Word is powerful. His Word is powerful. And it's just been in my spirit. I've just been really excited to know that God's Word created, made, will destroy, and will build back up. Because it's His Word. It's Him. So let's trust in Him. If you don't know Him for your personal Savior, all you have to do is ask Him. Come into my heart, Lord. Let me be in your family and you be in mine. Forgive me of all of my wrongdoings and clean me up, Lord. Don't you try to do it because you don't know how. But the Holy Spirit, once you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in immediately and begin to clean you up. Old song said, I looked at my hands and they looked new. I looked at my feet and they did too. Look at your heart, the transformation of your heart, and you won't be the same, never again. I love you, my brother, and I love you, my sister. Like us on Facebook, like us on YouTube, and give us a shout out. And most of all, please pray for us. Our, our word for next week is the word, going back to that mouth again, the word resurrects the dead. <laughs> the word resurrects the dead. And this is another good lesson. It's taken from John the 11th chapter verses 17 to it's a long one. A long one next week. 17 through 44. The word resurrects the dead. Verses uh, the, the 11th chapter Verses 17 to uh, 27. Let me do this right. 27. And then it picks back up with verses 38 to 44. Okay? And this is going to be good. The word not only heals, delivers, but it can also raise the dead. I thank you for listening. I thank you for your participation. And let's continue to walk together in Christ. I love you, my brother. I love you, my sister. And until the next time, if it's God's will, I'll see you. Just can't wait so that we can rightly divide the word of truth again. God bless you, and I love you. <laughs>